Hello, hello, everybody. I am Nicole Glenn. I am one of the co-hosts of the LLC podcast, and it's an honor to introduce listeners to inspiring women who are making a real difference in logistics and supply chain. With the LLC podcast, you'll hear inspirational stories, both personal and professional challenges our guests overcame, how their backgrounds help shape who they are today, and how they empower others giving back to their communities and often the world. Today is a little special treat because normally we just have a guest on, but today we have come back to the panel front. And so we are gonna talk about what is happening. I said, what the heck is happening uh, in logistics and supply chain today? So ladies, welcome back. It's been a hot minute since we've had this many people on a panel. I'm so excited to have us all here and really talking about what we know, which is, logistics right in some form or fashion so if you guys want to go around and just kind of introduce yourself again just because we have some new listeners that pop in um please go around the horn and and say hello and tell us who you are and really what you belong to (laughs) work-wise i'll start um i'm charlie safro i am the president and founder of cs recruiting we're a third-party recruiting firm that specializes in the transportation, logistics, and supply chain space. So very excited to talk about this topic. It's extremely relevant right now. So I'll go next. Uh, My name is Blythe Brimley. I am the founder of Digital Dispatch. And also just recently, starting in January, I went fully independent for my podcast, Everything is Logistics. So gosh, it's been a great start to the year. And I'm so happy to be back with you ladies. Hi all, I'm Liz Wayne, founder and president of Able Transport Solutions. Our little niche of the industry is flatbed heavy haul freight and uh, really excited to see all your beautiful faces again, be live on here again and have a good chat. And I'm Sharon Sire. Uh, I'm the founder and president of Saving Our Sisters, mentoring women uh, in the logistics industry as well as vice president and CFO of Talent Freight Services. Awesome. And I'm your host, your co-host, I guess you could say I'm Nicole Glenn, and I am the founder and CEO of Candor Expedite, which focuses on time-sensitive ground, air. It's so many now, middle mile, final mile, white glove services. And so I'm really excited to be back on here and get to talk shop with these ladies. So I'm going to kick it off because I keep reading article after article, seeing all sorts of post out there, reading pricing concepts in our space. And I've literally heard the words bloodbath. Um, for me, again, these are opinions. So everybody's different in the, in the world of transportation and really where your company sits and what you're, what you're trying to accomplish and what your strategy is on continually building your company. Uh, but for myself being in the expedited piece, I would feel that our group would be the first ones to really feel that it's almost like you see companies who are scheduling events they're usually one of the first uh companies that that see that downturn and for me i do not feel that we're in the space and i'll continually talk about it but i do want to throw it out to you ladies when you hear the term bloodbath how do you feel when you hear that in your sector of logistics I can kind of kick it off, I guess. Um, I mean, obviously, a lot of headlines, a lot of terms, a lot of phrases, they're they're scary, right, to think about. I think we all would be wise to keep our ear tuned to things right now, have an appropriate level of anxiety. Um, I actually read a book some years ago called Just Enough Anxiety. Like, you don't want, it's like, think of a rubber band, right? You don't want, there's no growth if it's not stretched a little bit, right? But you go too far and it snaps. So it's kind of the concept I'm applying to this market. Like, I think it's wise and smart to be a little bit anxious, but not to get too worried, you know? And so I feel grateful to be in my flatbed space. I feel overall the uh, peaks and valleys are a little more muted in our space, which helps at times like this. I think, you know, I wonder, I guess, Nicole, if if what your your opinion though is kind of based on being a younger and growing company, because I think companies right. like ours 
are in a far different position when these markets change than, you know, like a CH or a coyote or, you know, so um, that's where I'm at. I am paying very close attention. I am not making any drastic moves, um, but definitely putting some time frames on things when we would have to change operations, you know, um, if things don't give. And for us personally, like a lot of our customers are in the construction industry. Like that's where we offer the most support out here is to that industry. And so we always have slow winters. It's just kind of when the ground freezes, we slow down. And so I'm very much looking forward to March and April for that thaw. And then I, I can really, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah you know, so it's just longer to slow down than some of the other modes in mm -hmm. 2022, you know? And so like 2021 into 22, we didn't even have a slow season. Like we always have our slow season. It's kind of December through February. And mm -hmm. it really didn't happen last year, um, which was great. But I think it hit a little harder this year combined with all the headlines and that, you know, to, to stir a little bit of this anxiety. But um, it's all good. I think for us, it's more of like a normal winter season. And so I'm really hopeful for a normal spring season. Um, but yeah, I think smaller growing companies like ours are in a different position when it comes to staff levels and some other things that I know Charlie's going to give us some awesome insight about. I mean, Freight Waves came out today, said the freight brokerage, you know, world downsized by 700 total positions last year and already over a thousand this year. So that's the problem. That's what we're talking about. That's all of our bills, right, is payroll um, as a non-asset company. So I can't wait to hear what Charlie has to say about that. For me, hope is strong and I'm hanging tight in a lot of regards. So I'm in the freight brokerage business, too, and we're seeing a little different right now. Our largest customer is closing their doors. Oh God! We just found out yesterday. I wouldn't call it a bloodbath. But it is going to affect a lot of our other customers because they furnish product to those people. Mm -hmm. And so we're we're not in panic mode, but we're very cautious right now. We're being very uh, careful about uh, spending money. You know, we're having to reset our goals and uh, and but we have other customers. So I've been through this since I've been in the industry for over 30 years. This is not my first rodeo. Yeah. And so the stock, if this, what's always happened is the strong survive. So if you're smart and you handle your business right and you have a good balance of customers and you're right, we're in the talent handles a lot of the building and supply. So there is a, a lot of slowdown in building right now. Houses are, you know, people just, they can't get the supplies they need. So we're seeing the downside of that right now, but I do think it's going to come back. Charlie, let's hear from you. Yeah, I'll chime in. So I think Liz hit on this, but I would say if I had to pick one word for the way the market is and how people are feeling, it's fear. Um, there's a lot of fear in the market. And Maybe a year ago, this was being discussed in the talent world. It was predicted. There were so many companies hiring. A lot of them were making very frivolous hires, just bulking up their teams um, in preparation for a, a busy season, putting out crazy offers to get good talent. And we all, I mean, maybe a couple months after that, we started talking about our looming recession. And that's when the fear really kicked in. So we've seen a lot of layoffs you know, nationwide, worldwide. I think part of it is the presence on social media. You get on LinkedIn and you scroll and it seems like every other post is either I was let go and I'm open to work and looking or I just got myself a new job and everyone's congratulating them. And I think that part of that, this has happened before in the talent market. It's just out there now. We have exposure. We all are on social media. And quite frankly, these stories get a lot of attention, which usually it's amazing. People want to help people. So I don't want to say it's exaggerated. The numbers you shared, Liz, a thousand people out of the industry this year is a crazy number. But my gut tells me that the majority of these layoffs are low performers. And um, a lot of these companies are just cleaning house. So what we've noticed that is very interesting is, yes, we have this talent pool of individuals that have been laid off. They are currently unemployed. Some of them are restricted by non-competes, but 
they're looking and, and you know, their, their needs and wants have shifted. They're a little more desperate now to get a stable paying job. Mm-hmm. But what we've seen in the last six weeks is some really awesome talent that has surfaced. And I would say, ironically, right now, our talent pool of passive talent. So these are people that are employed, but they're open to opportunities. It's its best ever. And the only theory I can draw there is that fear. So these are candidates that have not been laid off, but their company has let go of people and they've seen that. Um, These are candidates who are just savvy and they're aware of the market and they're observing what's going on in their company um, and the messages. And again, their fear. So um, it's just interesting because while you've got this huge pool of talents that is available because they're unemployed, we're really seeing almost an, an equal amount of talent in this industry that is employed and looking. Um, so my advice there, it's, it's tricky because a lot of companies are in hiring freezes. A lot of companies have stalled searches just in panic mode or wanting to see the outcome. But right now is the time to hire. And I'm not just saying that for our business. I'm saying that because there is qualified, really strong, remarkable talent out there. And this is the time when, especially a smaller mid-sized company, you can secure them because you're able to offer that stability. You're able to offer some of these veterans an opportunity to come in and build something and have a voice if they maybe haven't had a voice for many years in a larger organization. So I know it's hard to find budget for like a proactive hire, but the talent is there and I don't know how long they're going to be there. And I think on the on the marketing side of things, we're, we're kind of seeing a, a bunch of different sort of evolutions within the industry come together at once. So for a while in marketing, it was very much, um, especially from a, a broker standpoint, you just recruit a kid right out of college, you sit him at a, at a desk and you make them do 100 cold calls every single day. Well, that not that necessarily doesn't work anymore you have to be a little bit more strategic. And I think that that's one aspect of it is that, you know, for a lot of freight brokers, I I follow a lot of freight broker subreddits and and just groups. And I'm hearing a lot of these different conversations about how these brokers are finding it really, really challenging to get new business. And then the business that they do have is starting to price shop. And so between those two things, plus AI kind of coming into the mix, it's really putting the onus on the business owner and to be responsible for more tasks than ever, but to also change those tasks that you're involved in. So you're you're being more strategic with your marketing, or you should be. And if you're not, then you're going to be facing a really challenging uphill climb when you have this new technology that's coming into the space. You have all of these different tech companies that are laying off a dramatic amount of of thousands of workers, you know, Microsoft, Amazon, um, just to name just a couple of them. But then you're putting uh, so much more responsibilities and expecting more from these workers that are left there. So it's it's a it's a, I think it's a bunch of different things coming together at once from the marketing and sales angle. So I have a question around that because it kind of reminds me of, you know, this this idea of technology in our industry and these tech brokerages. The goal is not always to replace headcount or to bring in technology or robots to do the work of a human. I think of it as if this technology can create efficiencies. You get a carrier rep who normally could move 10 loads a day. Now they can move 25 loads a day and everyone wins. Do you see AI replacing people or the way I'm looking at tech in our industry, enhancing people or supplementing, um, you know, with with content and things that people may struggle with? So are you seeing it actually replace headcount or do you think it's just more an opportunity to enhance? But a lot of the work is falling on the people that are still employed. I 100% think that I look at AI coming into the space as an enhancement on the employees that you already have. Like for me, for example, it it helps me, you know, chat GPT is is one of those things that that's all over the news and has been for months now. Microsoft is a big investor in it. Microsoft also owns LinkedIn. You sent me that great article about how LinkedIn is, is thinking about AI in the future. And I was thinking about how LinkedIn could be using these tools in the future because it would be a fairly significant update to LinkedIn if they were to incorporate some of these tools to help folks, 
you know, write their content faster and to get that message out faster. So then they can get back to the normal job duties of what they're expected to do. So I think that with AI coming into the space, it's going to get rid of, frankly, a lot of pointless middle managers that didn't really serve a, a, a high functioning job role. I think it's going to replace those managers, but I think it's going to only make the, the lower level employees and the mid management level. I think it's going to actually enhance those skill sets that they already have. So I think it's kind of a weeding out process. I mean, there are a lot of these tech companies have cut thousands of jobs, but they're still functioning and they're still operating smoothly. So I think it was kind of, you know, Twitter taking that, that first, sort of dive into the the layoff pool and it kind of gave all these other companies that excuse to get rid of some of the dead weight that they've been carrying. That's really interesting. Yeah, I agree with you. And one thing I didn't know before that I think is really important is many of the companies that are hiring right now are also the companies that are laying off. So um, that is a reflection of, you know, letting go of poor performers. It's also often a reflection of I think of it as like peacetime and wartime leaders, and maybe they've had leaders that have, you know, kept their company running smoothly, status quo through peacetime, but now we're, you know, in wartime where you need someone who's more aggressive, who's going to, you know, bring new strategies and, and really scale to that next level. So a lot of the companies that are laying off, I'd say they're not hiring, you know, masses of carrier sales reps to necessarily replace the people they laid off they're hiring for a key peak leadership position mm -hmm. that they believe may change the trajectory of the organization or that department. So yeah, and, culture yeah. And, and trying to lift that. So that way there's that functionality that can move forward within the company. One of the things I always talk to my team and really everybody about with the technology side is as we keep progressing, you know, through time, we're going to see more and more of, of technology stepping in the space. And what it's gonna force people to do is really focus on the human side of things. Mm -hmm. Because we will have bots and even robots in some cases and warehouses that, I mean, all of these things are, are coming and it's obviously happening in the brokerage world too. So those normal functions of track trace and the basics, right? That we see a lot of outsourcing for, near shore for, those things can be replaced with technology, but who's going to actually develop the relationship with the vendors? Who's going to develop the relationship with the customers? Who's going to problem solve to make things work? And for me, in my opinion, that's why a full tech company where you're seeing automated moves is really a struggle because there still has to be a, a complete human element to the company, but you almost need to have this balance between that technology, ease of use for your clients. Obviously, people are trying to lift their profitability, um, but you got to get in there and develop that human side of yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I tell all my people who aren't even in business development roles, like, don't even worry about us or candor. This is going to be an evolution of who you are in 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And I'm giving you the platform and the understanding to coach you through that now. Um, I mean, you're not even going to walk into McDonald's and and order food with somebody. It's going to be a machine, but there's still going to have to be some sort of human element to it, right? And some, I don't know what that looks like for them, but I think it's coming. And so my suggestion is work on those skills and get uncomfortable with putting yourself out there more to be that human element. So that way those skill sets and even five years for yourself you're going to overcome so many people who want to hide behind the word email. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And I would argue like empathy is probably the most important skill in the workplace today. It was frowned upon many years ago as, you know, someone who was weak if they were too compassionate or empathetic. But when you think of it, I mean, it is such a powerful skill. If you're a salesperson, you're putting yourself in your shipper's shoes to really understand their pain points and solve their problems. And Robots will never be empathetic. I know mm -hmm. that one Microsoft robot or AI was talking about wanting to be a human, but at the end of the day, I mean, maybe in the future, future, we'll see robots with emotions, who knows? But that's that's why we will always need that human to operate something behind the technology. Yeah, so I think too, and I've seen this over the years, is um, as, you, as you have the empathy and you get to know your customer and you build those relationships, 
when you get into the, the three box or four box selling, you've got to understand what their customers do. And I'm not so sure a robot's going to understand how to connect that all together. They probably will at some point. But if you can help them grow their business by helping them grow their business with their customers and their customers' customers, then you make yourself very valuable. And, uh, and our new generation needs to learn how to build those relationships. Now, they're very good, this, this Gen Z, they're very good at the, uh, with the technology, and I'm sure they'll figure out a way to make it all happen. But they do still need to learn that skill set of being able to talk face to face with somebody. And to Blake's point about the, the writing tools, it's very clear that it's garbage in, garbage out. So mm -hmm. again, even though you've got, you know, these amazing tools that can write copy for you, it's very easy to distinguish a copywriter who put in good content that was enhanced to be better versus someone who does not know what they're doing. They don't know the prompts um, and they're just, you know, writing something to, to expect output. Um, and that again is that human component. AI is going to help us along, but it it may never replace humans completely in some of these areas. Yeah, they, it still needs a lot of, of fine tuning and it still requires a lot of nuance and, and subject matter expertise. If you And that's one thing that I do worry about with, with Microsoft and, and ChatGPT and, and incorporating maybe something like that into LinkedIn because Microsoft does own LinkedIn. I worry that that is just going to be implemented uh, very hastily. And then it's just going to, I mean, we've all seen like cringy posts on LinkedIn and I feel like that's just going to really enhance the, the cringe part, but there's also opportunity in that, that if you are using these tools and you do have the subject matter expertise that your content can stick out because you are taking that extra step, you're using it as a tool in your tool belt and you're not using it as your only tool. So I want to shift the mindset and, and going forward in this conversation too, because we hear, obviously there are changes really in all of our, our companies, even though I said the word bloodbath, there still is a, is somewhat of a downturn, but at the same time, for me, I'm going to ask you guys your best practices when things do go down, but this is the rally time internally for my company to really understand that it is going to be what it's going to be, but it's, going to be better if we put in more effort during these times. And like you said, Charlie, even with this garbage in, garbage out, no, it has to be quality work that we're putting into the day to make a real impact. So I would love to hear your best practices to maybe audience members who are listening from your field on, on how that if they are in a slowdown or a cold front, you know, how do you keep that momentum within your organization to to stay or even grow during these times? I mean, I think, you know, the important thing is definitely to keep your ear to the ground so you can switch priorities as necessary. But yeah, for us, this is like dig deep time. You know what I mean? And so we are definitely like when we get nervous, we don't slow down, we go harder and go faster. So we definitely are working on some initiatives around here that we think really serve the customer. And it was interesting when Charlie mentioned that some companies are doing layoffs as well as hiring. It seems counterintuitive, but I mean, it makes perfect sense. I was just talking yesterday about how you know, what the shippers are up against in a market like 2021, well, 2020 and 2021 and it's like they're paying these historically high rates and because of a capacity crunch, they're getting historically terrible service, you know? And so like, do we all, I mean, is that something that we all go through together where here the customers need trucks, right? So we hire, we grow our companies, we get butts in seats. We're rushed. We're in a really big hurry. Are we training properly at that time? Um, I know we're not training for this market in that market, um, myself and everyone that I've talked to, you know, failed there, but it's hard. How do you, how do you train for both markets when you're in the most extreme end of the spectrum that anybody's ever seen? And so um, it's interesting, though, because I think like we did that to ourselves, too, with when, when you say people are letting go of underperformers. 
did we as the freight brokerage owners and leaders, did we accept underperformance during this crazy market? We did because we had to. We needed butts in seats, right? And how did that affect our customers? And now that we can breathe, how are we shifting the focus back to the customer experience um, and really trying to make some improvements there for when things get a little bit better? You know, I mean, right now, customers are going through that cutting phase. Like you don't need the hundred carriers and brokers that you did in 2021. Now you want to cut that down to 30. And what are we doing to make sure we make the cut? Can Do you I think, Liz, I wanted to ask you one question off of your statement. Do you think that maybe the folks that are considered underperformers really aren't, but they didn't get the toolkit to be successful in these oh, organizations? Very potentially, there is a lot of that going on. I mean, I'm not going to say in every case because we know this business and we know some people just don't get it and some people just don't like it. Right. And that's fine. But yes, as a whole, as an industry, I'm going to say if we brought you into this space in 20 and 21, we probably did not give you a well-rounded um, set of tools to, to get out here and compete in this new market, you know? So then what do we do? I have not done any layoffs. We have slowed down quite a bit. It's all about refocusing, mm -hmm. trying to shift the focus back to the customer. Okay. Like we know when we hired you, it's like first truck wins, get a truck, get a truck. But now customer expectations are back to where they should be, which is much That's higher, true. much. So it's like, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily in a rush to, you know, lay off people that don't understand that. Like, let's give an opportunity to retrain to this market. Let's give people an opportunity. Let's see who wants to step up and be customer facing. You know, who wants to bring the new ideas that are going to bring the customer experience we're looking for. Um, but it's just kind of. And for me, it's not like a shift in culture. I mean, I've always thought about the customer, but gosh, if I try to put myself in people's shoes who came into the industry two and three years ago, I mean, do they see it? That, I mean, are, can we even blame them if they don't fully know and understand the customer's needs? Like probably not because the customer's needs were so different during that time. Yeah. Well, it's harder to find the customer's needs now because of, uh, <laughs> they don't answer the phone anymore. They don't have to call our ID or whatever. They have a hundred carriers and they only yeah. want 30. They're not talking yeah. to anybody. So you've got to be able to stand out. You have mm -hmm. to be able to have to be able to see something in you that they don't see. And that's the thing that you have to figure out. It's what makes you though. different than everybody else. Right. I, I was actually with Kevin Hill yesterday. We did a put down that coffee recording and we literally talked about that on how you stand out. I go to conference and I meet truckload brokers and I'm like, hi, I'm Nicole. I do blah, 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 blah. You know, you, you have your pitch on who you are as a niche person. And they go, hi, I'm a truckload broker. I'm like, and <laughs> like, what? Give me more. <laughs> and it, it really is that. And so when you put yourself into that pool of just that, like if life was like, I'm just a marketer, people are going to go, of uh, like you have to know that core strength because then you're not delivering that message mm -hmm. to that audience. So now they've already weeded you out because they have a hundred other of you dialing their phone number. And so, I mean, this could be a great question for Blythe since she is in the marketing world. How do these people stand out with their marketing and their messaging? Like what, what would you suggest with that? I, I think it's for a lot of companies, they think that they make one LinkedIn post and that's it. And they should just endlessly get leads from it just because they post on LinkedIn, you know, maybe once a month. And that's just not how it works. You have to stay in front of people. It has to be an investment, a time investment, not necessarily monetarily. But so that that's one aspect of it is that you have to invest the time and you have to put in the work of using those conversations that you're already having with your customers, those same questions that they're asking you is probably the same questions that other customers have. And so if you can speak to that, if you can, 
you know, address those concerns and do it in a public forum and do it consistently, then you're going to attract those same customers that you're desperately out there trying to, you know, cold call a hundred times a day. So I think that that's definitely one aspect, but I think that some brokers are just so worried about excluding customers that they're afraid to focus on a niche. Like one, one client in particular, you know, he had a very strong angle for the messaging that he wanted for his website. And that was um, giant wind turbines. And I thought, how cool to be able, I mean, obviously it's a limited market, but how cool would that be to talk about on a consistent basis? And ultimately he um, pulled that niche focused from his site and instead just focused very uh, generalized on, on the different freight that he moves. And I thought that was kind of a mistake. Um, I think that you should embrace the niches and because the niches are in the or the riches are in the niches, as they say, because if you start small, you can always expand out right. and you can always add more markets. But, you know, people aren't going to Nicole's point. People aren't going to know you or really remember you unless you can be specific. Well, and when you have a niche, you get referrals. Because the people that know you and know you do a good job, they'll refer you to somebody else in their industry. Then you join those industry uh, organizations and you become a speaker at those organizations and you become the expert in their field. And that, you know, you just have to figure out a way to get in. But I, I'm a firm believer in the niches. Yeah. And Charlie, for you, a question on this is because you're dealing with many different layers within organizations. Mm -hmm. As you talk to different layers, or your, your teammates do, do you notice that there's a different kind of put out on what, a, say, an owner of a company is trying to convey to retain and get people to come into the door from a, a mid-level manager with clarifying that marketing message? Do you see that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think where you're going with that is this this idea of talent branding. And, you know, every company has a brand. It's how hard you work on the brand, how much you do with it. But you're all targeting shippers and carriers and putting messages in front of them about your service offering. There's a separate brand that is the talent brand that if you are hiring or planning to hire anytime in the future, it's just as important. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just a pivot. Um, and, you know, Nicole, just knowing enough about your business, your brand is expedite when you're going out and marketing to shippers. And maybe your brand for the talent and for recruiting and retention is about people who love the thrill, who love the rush, who love you know taking on big projects and putting all the pieces together to, to come up with a solution. But that needs to be front and center. Why should I work there? Why should I even apply? Why should I entertain this interview? And then why should I accept the offer? And then that all plays into why should I stay here? Um, and that's something that in a downtime like this, every company can be working on their talent brand. Um, and it could be different people in the company. If you're slow, leadership, salespeople, carrier sales, certainly marketing or HR. Um, but how are we retaining our current people? And what is our plan and our strategy? Not necessarily around recruiting new people, but creating the perception in the market about this being a great place to work. So people come to us. And it's Sharon, exactly what you said. It's it's referrals. It's just referrals for employees versus referrals for business. But having a strong brand is front and center right now. I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it is hard to get that marketing message out mm -hmm. on your culture. And we see a lot of the same type of posts. Like now you're seeing even on LinkedIn, oh, I had dinner with so-and-so. And now you're just starting to scroll, right? You're Before it was like, oh, a picture of humans. I'm going to stop, you know, but you're <laughs> not, you're not any, I'm not, you know, mm -hmm. I'm looking for more of actual content that's going to teach me something or really make an impact on a culture. Like when you see those types of big things, they stick out. And so everyone has to up their marketing game, <laughs> in my opinion, and it is hard to do and it is costly. And mm -hmm. I, and I think that uh, a lot of people don't understand that it just can't be one person. Like you said, Blythe, that's doing a post. It has to be really front and center through your entire organization mm -hmm. and getting everyone to buy in to, and drink the Kool-Aid of why it matters to market in a time like this. I think um, Freight Vana is, is a great example of this. I, I, I've talked to um, a, a few of their guys for a while now, and they all 
join it. They have, you know, sort of the, the yellow background for their, that's the same as the company logo. And they have the yellow background for their avatar on, on LinkedIn. They're all consistently posting on various social media platforms about, you know, the culture within the office. And then also, you know, they, they have a really great campaign. The one load shift is, is one tree planted. And so, you know, they, they actually said now that when they go to conferences because of their time investment into LinkedIn over the last year, that shippers are coming up to them, wanting to book meetings with them and meet them. And so that is a direct, you know, ROI that you can see and that you can feel and that they're doing it from both sides where they're appealing to customers and they're also appealing to people who may want to work for them. Mm-hmm. That's such a great shout out, Blythe. I actually, I do a talent branding workshop and I use Freightvana as an example of a company that does it right in this industry. Mm-hmm. And they're a small company and they're a new mm-hmm. company and they are more well known than most of, you know, these longstanding brokerages because they're putting humans first mm-hmm. and their talent brand is all around their people and diversity and will accept you the way you are. So, and they're consistent and they're mm-hmm. committed and that's really what's gotten them where they are. And they, I think they focus on fun, too, because a lot mm-hmm. of their marketing efforts, again, with that culture, show that they are a fun group. And when you do meet them in person, because I have met quite a few of them, it's just like you're laughing mm-hmm. instantly. You're talking about something and they're just it seems to be that that marketing piece is really what makes the them up like that is not a front and i i give them such kudos too and everyone you can feel that kind of they're all bought in on on their mission and Mm -hmm. i think a lot of companies miss out on getting that with their team for sure and that because it it turns a cold lead into a a warm lead or a a cold you know relationship into a warm relationship whenever you do finally meet them in person yeah and that's what companies who are overstaffed right now should be working on is mm-hmm. achieving that level of, you know, influencer status, if you will, within our industry. And when you think of it from a recruiting standpoint, everything is marketing. You are selling yourself as a company. You are selling yourself as a decision maker in the interview process. That first email that you send a candidate, whether you're responding to their application, whether you found them on LinkedIn or you saw their resume that is going to make or break the deal. And that's the type of stuff that companies don't have enough time for in a busy time and where they can really put their resources now. Let's work on having the same way you focus on your email drip campaigns to get customers. Let's work on these messages that we're sending prospective employees. And we may not be hiring now, but it will be really helpful when we pick up again and all this work is done. Well, and it's also good to get people kind of in line, right? So- Mm -hmm. That relationship, I think employers think that it's, I interviewed you, come to my company today. Um, We've had some individuals that I I say, hey, we had this lady that interviewed. She was great. She didn't fit this position. What about this? And so our team is keeping that mindset Mm -hmm. and kind of touching candidates again, like, hey, how is this going? How have you uh, developed in that role? Are you still feeling this way? We have a different opportunity that might appeal to you. And it's not just a you know, one and done, like we interviewed you by, um, it's a, it's a consistent to see like, all right, they did seem to fit our culture and they did have that enthusiasm that we were looking for. So again, no, sometimes means just not right now. And we're in a very skills-based hiring market right now, which is a good thing. And Another thing employers could be doing is evaluating the skills of the assets that are already on their team, Hmm. Um, because whether it's soft skills or hard skills, that that is how you can repurpose someone. That is how you can, you know, retain them longer if they're not producing revenue or build a new position for them in the future or create a new service offering. Just knowing that someone on your team, I mean, we, we did a skills survey recently and you know, there's three or four people on our team who love writing. I never knew that. That is not part of their job, but we have plenty of, you know, content opportunities for some creative writers. So really assessing who do we already have? Where are the gaps? And then when you go out to hire, you're focused on that skill and the person, which is the soft skill, more so than I want to hire someone who did this job at my competitor. Right. So we're already almost at time, which Mm -hmm. I knew would go so fast with having us all on here. You guys give some great insight, but I do want to go around the horn one more time. So we've again, touched base, you know, saying that this environment can be a little shaky. It can be fearful. And so 
even if it's something you already said, let's let's say those, you know, top four, in your opinion, takeaways that people should be focused on. So when they listen to this, they know, write these things down, people, and take action. So I'm going to start with Liz on your top takeaway that for best practice people should be doing right now. My top takeaway would be one of the best things I learned from a former boss of mine, but he would always say success in this business is created during the downtime. So like 2021, it's easy, right? Right. Like now what you do now, the investment you make in next year, the planning, all of that is what will bring the success of the future. So what we do in our downtime is what determines our success. So get to work. I love that. I do. Sharon, what's yours? So I say this too shall pass mm -hmm. and use this time to rethink about how you're doing business because you can't stay in the past. Things that were working 10 years ago don't work today. Think about how you can change for the future and use this time to work with your people. Think about it, group think and come together with a plan. That's awesome. Why? I would say embrace the pivot because no matter change is the only constant and no matter what kind of technology comes into the space, what kind of shifts are going on within the marketplace, being able to pay attention and identify and embrace that pivot will always help you in your career. Charlie. Yeah, I would say there's a lot of great talents in the market right now. And if you are in a position to take advantage of it, I would highly recommend it. We talked about these passive candidates, but going back to Liz and Nicole's point, if someone was laid off, that does not mean that they don't have the skills or the motivation or the passion to come be a top performer at your company. So really considering the entire market, what, what didn't work at a past company could be very easily solved with a new service, with new leadership, new technology. So give people a chance and um, build, your, build your bench strength right now. You don't need to extend offers, but build those relationships because you're going to need them one day. And then my last piece of advice would be to really identify what your strategy is going to be going forward. Put your blinders on a little bit, step back from the media and really mm -hmm. focus in on your business. Obviously, like Liz said, you know, keeping your ear to the ground and seeing what's going on, but don't let other businesses make or break you because even what we said in the beginning, I'm not in a bloodbath, but I'm also a certain size company you know, on a mission to do something different. So look at your own individual, even it's your role, you know, like what is your role within a company and focus on how you can make it better and what can be different by hard work and determination. And I think you'll still see some results for increase for this year. So ladies, thank you so much for joining me and being back together today. It feels great um, I look forward to doing this again with you guys. Oh, yeah. soon. We're going to be throwing these out quarterly. So anybody who's listening, if you have a great topic that you do want to hear from us cover, please feel free to send us a note. We do have a page on LinkedIn. Um, you can also reach myself on LinkedIn, send me a direct message, and we would love to get that topic discussed amongst us. Christy Knitchell, we miss you very much. We mm -hmm. hope you're having a great week and we'll be seeing you guys again soon. Bye.